John, how you doing? Great. How you doing, Ernie? Real good. So here we are, our very first podcast. And uh, boy, this was kind of a whim, wasn't it? Uh, I think we both have been thinking about it for a while. And then you says, hey, we ought to do one. So here we are a couple of days later and <laughs> our uh, our first podcast. Who knows how many this is going to uh, generate, but uh, we've got to start somewhere, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I was talking to a customer this weekend and uh, he had said, uh, you know, he was on social media trying to find out what to do for spring planting and, and looking for some instruction. And he called me and said that he was just inundated with pro staffers and information and do this, do that, do this, do that. And he called me and asked for help. And, and after I got off the phone with the gentleman, I think I called you and I said, we really need to do this. And so here we are. Hopefully we can, you know, we can uh, separate the wheat from the chaff and maybe head people in the right direction and save them some heartache and food plot failures down the road. But no, I, I think just I think just point people in the right direction and and uh, you know giving them the information that 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 has worked for me or worked for you or if we ever talk to a few people worked for them. I like to uh, to to offer facts and in 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 the real real life experiences, not not something that oh I think this will work or I heard this will work or you know we get to talk to a lot of a lot of good people in this industry and and lean on a lot of good people so. You know, hopefully we'll have uh, information that uh, that's that's useful to everyone. Yeah, and and I think too, uh, you know, like you said, we have talked to a lot of different people, and we've uh, we've tried a lot of these uh, things that we've learned from people over the years, and found out uh, what has worked and what hasn't worked, and mm -hmm. and uh, what the challenges are, and, and hopefully be able to lead people to not have to reinvent the wheel for themselves, and that would be great. So mm -hmm. so anyway, and, and you know, in case uh, you know. A lot of people know who you are. They know who Northwoods Whitetails is, but I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that don't. So, you know, just real briefly, j just let people know, you know, who your company is, where you're located, and, and exactly what you do. We are uh, located in Menominee, Michigan, just north of Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, we started Northwoods Whitetails, I want to say, I don't know the exact date, but somewhere around 2009, 2010, and then uh, 2000. 12 August 1st was when we actually started online with seed sales and been growing ever since. I mean, the, the yearly growth with Northwoods Whitetails has been um, amazing. I've never in my wildest dreams that I think would get to be as big as it is. And uh, I can't, any, anybody out there that's listening that, that, that uh, has purchased product from us, I can't thank you enough. And you've uh, helped us create a pretty special company, but um, you know, it, it started with, I, I really, really in, uh, enjoyed putting in food plots that, you know, we, we are like most people in upper Michigan, you're hunting over bait piles. And I just didn't think that was the way to go. And we started out like most folks with a little rye, a, real, a little rye food plot and then graduated to clovers and then got into the brassicas and tried soybeans and tried just about everything on the market. And, you know, I, I, fell, I fell into the, you know, watching, uh, I really like Mark Drury and Jerry Drury. I think those two are the, probably the, uh, you know, um, the pinnacle of, of the uh, whitetail industry as far as video goes. But, I, you know, you got to think, keep in mind, they're in, they're in the middle of Iowa. And, and what works in Iowa doesn't exactly work in upper Michigan. But I was buying their biologic and, and planting this and that and the other thing. And I'm like, man, this just isn't, you know, this isn't looking the way they're doing it or what have you. So I started doing my own mixes, started doing my own thing. And it turned out really, uh, really nice. And then we started doing mixes and pellet and food pods for other people. And it uh, turned into the company we have today. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you, you had really um, studied and talked to a guy out in Iowa by the name of Paul Knox, who some people might know mm -hmm. as Doubletree on a lot of forums. Yeah, and, um, yeah. You know, yeah, at the same time, I was doing the same thing on the Michigan Station <laughs> Forum. I was I yep. was following everything the guy was writing, and he posted lots mm -hmm. of pictures. And you want to talk about being able to fast forward your knowledge. And, you know, mm -hmm. he, he really did the same thing that I, I hopefully we're going to be able to do for other people, you know. Yeah, I, and I, I think uh, the, the, the thing that, that – I miss greatly about Paul Knox is that he brought a lot of civility to those forums. I mean, you didn't see the bickering and the, the, uh, just the, you know, the arguments that 
you know, whether it was because of Paul or, or not, but the thing with Paul is you couldn't BS the guy, you know, he wasn't right. trying to yeah. sell something. And, and if you look at, if you look at how the base products that started our company was based around Paul's theories with three strips, the, excuse me, the, the three strip system. And then we've kind of taken it off on a couple of, tangents are here or you know we've gone a couple of different ways with a few products but by and large you know I had a, I had talked with Paul for many many months prior to to uh, starting the company and and Paul was one of the guys that was in, instrumental in uh and 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 a mentor uh when we started our company yep yep and you know hey good christian guy and yep. just always had a heart for helping people and and uh, mm-hmm. yeah yeah I I uh, you know and, and his son you know was carrying on the company Yes, they started, yep. and and I uh, you, yeah, you I get still to talk to him once in a while, right? Yeah, I get to talk to Jesse a couple times here. I like to bounce things off of him. You know, I got some ideas, and, and when we were developing the crimper, I was talking to him. He's used it a couple times. Used one out in Iowa, and I was talking to him about it. You know, weights and, and sizes and things like that. And uh, he really likes. He seemed to like what we were doing out here. So, I don't think mm-hmm. you can ever re- replace Paul, but I think you can sure try to uh, do things the way he he was doing them. So. Yep. That's what we're trying to do. Yep, yep, exactly. So, you know, I, I'm not exactly, uh, you know, the, the food plot seed expert like you are, but uh, <laughs> I'm kind of on the other end where <laughs> I guess part of what, you know, I like to do is, you know, figure out how deer are using the property. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, so I'm in the habitat side more uh, of right. uh, the food plot end of it. So, you know, where where should food plots go? Where should food plots not go? which sometimes is, you know, a very important uh, part of the puzzle. I, I guess one thing I always try to convey to some of my clients is, you know, the, the most effective food plot is a food plot where you can hunt it undetected and not let those deer know that they're being hunted. Otherwise, it's like, you know, it's going to go nocturnal really quick. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I've seen that a few times. <laughs> I'm not the best <laughs> at locating the food plots, but I can I can sure grow one heck of one. So, <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, you've got the, uh, you've got the food plot company, uh, food plot seed company, Northwoods Whitetails, and I'm with you know, Strategic Habitat. I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan area. Been here all my mm-hmm. life and married three daughters who are now married and two, nine grandkids. And it's like, you know, man, where did all that time go, you know? But yeah, um, for, for me, you know, it's uh, some of the most important things for me is, you know, faith, family, friends, and, and uh, then the outdoors, you know, in that order. You know, I, I started a pallet company about 28 years ago, and and after 26 years, uh, that was long enough, and decided <laughs> to move on from that and get into the outdoor industry. Because to be honest with you, the pallet company was kind of getting in the way of my uh, habitat consulting. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sold that to uh, sold that to a trucking company that was doing a lot of our freight, and uh, worked out really well. They uh, they wanted me to hang around, and I still have my office upstairs up there. And so that's, uh, that's working really great. But, you know, now I'm like your seed company. It's, it's really been, uh, I mean, this year just kind of went crazy. You know, I've been traveling mm-hmm. all over the place, uh, you know, from Kansas to New York to, you know, upper Wisconsin down to Kentucky and, and everywhere in between. So it's been, it's been a lot of fun. You know, I like traveling anyway. And, you, you know, one thing about this business, and I, I think you can probably uh, agree is that, you know, most of these landowners that are looking to, improve their deer hunting, improve their habitat. You know, they're all good salt of the earth people, you know, mm-hmm. and, and just, just great, kind, uh, passionate people that, you know, want to leave a, a, a good hunting property for their kids. And um, it, it, they're just a joy to be around. And, uh, you know, we're, we're all like-minded. We all seem to be um, from the conservative side of things. And, you know, it's just, um, you know, everybody loves their country and, it's just, uh, man, it's just a wonderful thing to be able to, you know, rub elbows with these kinds of people all the time. And it wasn't always like that in the pallet business, you know, so <laughs> consider our, we consider ourselves pretty lucky, I think. Yeah, I've got to meet uh, hundreds of folks in the last few years, and, and it's, uh, you know, get to go to a bunch of properties and look at food plots. And, yeah, it, it, that's probably one of the, 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 the most uh, enjoyable parts of the job is going out to people's properties and just trying to help them set them up, set the food plot up right and, you know, trying to get stuff to grow. And then when you, you get that, that picture or that, that email that a, they, the food plots doing what you need it to do, you know, obviously growing and, and putting out forage or B my favorite is, is when you get that harvest photo, you know, 
boy's first year, girl's first year, grandpa's last year, unfortunately. But, you know, they, they, they were uh, able to harvest it over something you helped create. That always, to me, that's sometimes I get more joy out of that than, than seeing, uh, putting a deer down myself. Yeah. You spurred a thought there. Cause, um, when, when somebody wants to create a food plant for the very first time, they've already got their property and you know, maybe they've been doing bait piles all these years. And they said, you know what, I'm done doing bait piles. I want to do something where, you know, I can actually grow something. And, you know, I think everybody, every, every hunter's probably got some sort of uh farmer in them, you know, where they want to plant sure. something and watch it grow. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. what's more fun than, than that? Right. And then to be able to right. shoot a deer over it is, you know, icing on a cake. And so, you know, the excitement level of wanting to put in a food plot sometimes leads to, you know, well, here's an open spot on the property. Let's just put one here, you know, and see what will grow. Mm -hmm. And lots of times, you know, I'll see when I visit properties that, you know, sometimes it's just not always in the right spot because sometimes it's it's right next to a an access trail where that access trail leads to six or seven different tree stands. And, you know, they're blowing deer out of that food plot almost every time they go up hunting, you know. So, you know, those are some of the things that I try and help people with and you know sometimes it's a it's a bitter pill to swallow but over the course of time I mean it, in the long run it, it's going to pay off so mm -hmm. uh, but yeah you know I so that kind of leads into the question um, why should every food plot have a clear purpose there, there's lots of different reasons uh, you know to have a food plot so what are what are some of the reasons that you've seen or that that people should think about you know when they plant a food plot well I, I guess the the two food plot criteria as we look at is it going to be a a destination food plot or is it b going to be a kill plot a hunting plot and there's there's times when you can hunt the destination plot you know but whatever the purpose of the food plot is and, and i'm sure you can relate to this you've got to be able to enter and exit undetected so when you have a destination food plot you know if you're in big wood big woods area uh maybe not so much egg but this is where the deer are going to end up at dark for that for that nighttime feeding. So you know, sun goes down and they're heading to this particular food plot. This is where they're going to spend the first couple hours of dark. That's what we call a destination food plot. I'd like to see it at least a half acre. You know, that one behind our house that we're doing all the videos and pictures of. That seems to be the destination for the local deer herd, and then they mm -hmm. kind of disperse off to the horse pasture, cow pasture, whatever. But you know, you got to have, we call those the meat and potato food plots. You got to have your, you know, your, a good brassica planting. Well, you don't have to have it, but that's what we recommend uh, a buffet style. That's where our two or three strip system comes in. You've got a lot of brassica. You've got a lot of cereal grains. Now we're talking September through December, uh, uh, maybe January, but brassicas, cereal grains, late planted soybeans. Uh, you can add to the cereal grains, winter peas, peas. Uh, things like that. Sometimes if you're not in egg area, we'll add a bunch of white clover. We'll add white clover strips in there. If you're in egg areas, maybe we skip the white clover, except maybe right up against the woods where you can have licking branches and stuff like that. That's what we would call for a destination food plot. A lot of food in a small area like that, half acre, two acres, three acres. Our, one of the properties we manage, we have a four acre destination food plot. Now the hunting plot is going to be you know, between the bedding area and the destination food plot. Now, if you're hunting a piece of property that doesn't have the destination food plot, but you've got the bedding area, you can put in a little tiny eighth acre kill plot, you know, maybe with a travel corridor leading to and from where you think they're going to be going for the evening feed. And you're just going to catch them at night, getting out of the bedding areas, stopping at this little food plot. Typically you're talking eighth acre, sixteenth of an acre, you know, maybe 20 by 20. And in, the, in those, we typically, we uh, usually put clover and chicory mix or cereal grains like rye and oats, and then maybe some crimson clover. Something like that, that's going to keep regenerating because it's going to get a, a bunch of mouths. You're probably going to be lacking sunlight in the fall. To, so you got a lot of things working against you um, to try to grow a lot of food. Like say, if you put brassicas in those small kill plots, it just might not work. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so I had this one uh, client that um, his property was long and narrow, and he only had access mm -hmm. from from one from one end. And he had to literally go through basically his whole property to to get to the back of it, you know. And he couldn't understand that, you know, he was just blowing out all the deer every time, you mm -hmm. know, he would try and enter the back of the property. So 
Uh, one other thing that you know might help guys if they're in that kind of a situation and they want to, um, they, you know, it's hard for them to hunt the edges like some guys can when they have access all the way around the property. So if you have that situation where basically you have to start on one end and work your way through the property as the season progresses, you know, what I've done for a couple guys is, is have them plant some uh, soybeans really late at the front of the property. Mm -hmm. And so the, the soybeans are going to grow. They're going to be young. They're going to be tender by the time the bow opener opens. And right. they're not, they're going to, they're going to get destroyed and they will, they won't ever grow bean pods because they won't grow bean pods. It's not going to be a food plot. That's going to be attractive later in the season. Mm -hmm. And so by hunting that little late planted soybean plot up front, you know, they're going to be able to leave those other plots in the rear of the property, you know, for later. And, and at that point, you know, you can just kind of progress through the property um, as the season goes on and you know not turn that whole property nocturnal you know before gun season even arrives so that that, that might be another reason uh to do a food plot but um mm -hmm. you're right i like the uh i like the the regener the regenerative food plot that you mentioned like cereal rye and uh, mm -hmm. oats and the crimson yep. clover i mean boy you, you really can't you really can't hardly beat that for you know a food, little food plot that even if the deer hit it really hard you know it's pretty browse mm -hmm. resistant yeah, that and the, that rye can take some really crappy soil. I mean, if you, a lot of guys that are, are going to do food plots this year, uh, lower Michigan's got the baiting bin, you know, so a lot of guys are going to be carving out food plots. And I've seen a lot of pictures, got a lot of customers talking about it. You know, you're in sandy soil on an oak ridge or you're in just down in a cedar swamp where it's uh, it's dark. It's not the best soil, acidic, and that you can't, you can't go wrong with with winter rye rye grain. No, we're not talking rye grass. We're not talking the grass seed. Okay, that that goes in your yard. I've got rye grass planted all around my house, and I don't have the deer in there eating right now. <laughs> we're talking the <laughs> rye grain, the bigger cereal rye. Okay, that to me is about as easy food plotting as you can get. Yeah, and it comes back the next spring. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We were we were on a we were on a food plot tonight. Uh, one of the properties we manage, and it just. It somehow exploded this week. I was out there ten days ago and it wasn't uh, wasn't doing the greatest. And I thought, gosh, this isn't coming back. Well, it somehow we got two or three days of, you know, we had a re real nice weekend, and it just exploded. And, and that, that we took a picture and it was about fifteen deer on on one end, just stuff in their face full of rye. So yeah, that's fall and then it comes back the following spring to help the deer. But yeah, that's yep. you get those new food plots, buckwheat and rye, great uh, great planting. Yeah. So. Um, a lot, a lot of guys will ask me, uh, boy, you know, I planted a food plot last year and it really didn't do very well. And, uh, you know, I really don't know what I did wrong. You know, total food plot failure, blah, blah, blah. And mm -hmm. I says, well, first question I always ask, did you do a soil? Did you do a soil test? And, mm -hmm. um, no, I really didn't. I was kind of in a hurry. I didn't have time. And really, you know, so, you know, there's lots of, lots of different reasons why guys don't do a soil test. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> especially yeah. for a first time food plotter and I've been there I've done it you know and I, yep. I fell victim to it so you know what what in your mind is one of the biggest reasons why guys would want to do a soil test well you know it, it it's going to point you in the right direction one of the things I found up here and actually in a lot of the upper peninsula we've done a lot of uh, consulting on food plots is the high level of phosphorus and where where I had that aha moment was when we were doing brassica plantings. We started managing a property here that, that we had some fairly large food plots to put in. In the first year, they were really nice. But we start, I noticed towards the uh, end of September, early October, we started getting a little bit of yell yellowing. Some of the plants died. And I'm, I'm like, ah, what's, what's up with that? So fast forward to two years ago, we had one spot. It just, they just weren't growing like I knew this sweet feast mix could do because I've I've seen it in other food plots and it's just amazing and I'm, I'm looking at them just something isn't right so we ended up pulling a soil sample and we were doing soil samples but we were doing them in the spring so I ended up doing the soil sample right before we started tilling under the red clover for the sweet feast well we were we were extremely high in phosphorus didn't need any our calcium was low our magnesium was low and once we adjusted our fertilizer to that, it was amazing how how things turned out. I mean, they grew the way they were supposed to grow. Now, you know, was that the cause of the fail? And I wouldn't call I wouldn't consider it a failure the last couple of years, but 
I would venture to say they weren't doing as well as they should have compared to some of the sweet piece mm-hmm. brassica plantings we had in other parts of the county. So that was an eye opener. Um, the other thing is that I'm looking for, you know, now that, and, and eventually we'll, we'll talk about this, but reading so much with Gabe Brown, Dave Brandt, Ray Archuleta, one of the things they preach is organic matter in your soil. And the, the soil test we get is uh, Rock River Labs out of Waterton, Wisconsin. We've got their soil test kits, which lists organic matter. And it's kind of amazing to, to, to go from food plot to food plot to food plot on the same parcel and see different uh, percentages of organic matter. So that that is another. And then I can actually, when we're doing this this uh, three strip where we're taking you know the grains and tilling it in and uh, planting our brassicas and flip-flopping everything and, and we're doing a little bit of shallow tilling you know the 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 cereal rye and the red clover get tilled under it's it's amazing to actually see that organic matter number going up you know not as much as if we were doing straight no till but it is going up so mm-hmm. that's that's yeah. me I, I the first thing i look at everybody wants to look at ph i don't look at ph i look at organic matter percentage yeah mm-hmm. because you know i i think uh i think i've heard gabe brown say this that once mm-hmm. you get your ph uh rising and, and it's uh, and it reaches a certain level and you've got mm-hmm. all the uh, microorganisms uh, doing the work for you underneath the surface mm-hmm. that, you know, we, we can't see and don't know are there. I mean, mm-hmm. shoot, after a while, the pH is, uh, they, they fix the pH for you. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. When your organic yeah. matter is go- going up, your pH is going up too. But I, yeah. I think that's going to be a whole other, <laughs> a whole other podcast. I, that's, that should be a goal of ours, right? Is to get Gabe on here and let him explain it to him or explain it to us himself. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Yep. So, so John, you mentioned that um, you, you saw on your soil test that the phosphorus was too high. Yes. So w- were you able to do anything to lower it or did you uh, just concentrate on everything else and not put any phosphorus on? It was not in the extreme. It was just at just above adequate. So we ended up just not, we just didn't use any, you know, the mm. typically what a lot of guys do for for brassicas and, and myself included up until a couple of years ago was you know a couple hundred pounds of triple 19 and, and urea now this is what we for brassicas i mean obviously your your clover you're going to do something else and your cereal greens and stuff you're going to do something else but this is just the brassica and if you're adding all that phosphorus in you're 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 kind of really shooting yourself in the foot if you've got high high phosphorus and you're you're adding even more it's just not something you want to be doing so yeah um okay. i definitely and and again if you're going to do a soil test make sure you're doing it before you're adding your your lime in in your in your fertilizer i mean it, it sounds kind of silly but uh, i've seen it done before so uh you, you want to make sure you're you're pulling that soil sample um before your fall plotting or your fall uh fall plantings yep okay so i think one of the uh <laughs> And I kind of chuckle when I say this, but, you know, I, I've seen it many times and I know people have probably asked you personally many times, but, you know, one of the, one of the biggest loaded questions that anybody can ask us is, you know, what's the best food plot choice of plants to grow in my food plot? And, you know, it's, uh, you know, the sexy answer is, you know, soybeans or mm-hmm. brassicas, uh, you know, all, th- th- those are like the meat and potatoes. I mean, those are the sexy things. Those are what sell on TV. What's the first thing you do when you answer that kind of a question? What's the first thing you ask? <laughs> um, we have uh, five questions we ask. You know, what's <laughs> right. the size of your food plot? What's your deer density? Are you an egg farming area or not? How's your soil? Is it sand? Is it, it and it, it's hard for people to say, you know, wow, I got mm-hmm. good dirt. Or, okay, well, that kind of helps. And then what are we doing here? What's the size of the pot? What are we going to do here? Is this a, is this a destination food plot? Is this a kill plot? So, right. you know, the, the, the number one thing I'd like to see is something that's going to grow to its full potential. And we were talking before about why we did this podcast. I've seen guys recommend brassicas for guys planting in sand. I'd never do that. Why would you do that? Right. You know, you, you, you have no idea how much fertilizer and how much rain you better get. It'll, you can get them to grow. Don't get me wrong. Somebody out there listening is saying, I've got brassicas growing in sand. Okay. But yeah. for, for, for most folks, it's not going to work. Right. So what I'd like to see is once you give me the answers to these four or five questions, 
what's going to work the best for you in your situation. And it might be rye or a fall forage mix or rye notes. It might just be that. That might be what you can get to grow the best for those deer. And it's going to taste good, uh, you know, and it's going to be, there's going to be more nutrition in that than if you were to put uh, brassicas out there and all your numbers are way off and your organic matter is down at half a percent and you're, they come up and they get the size of a golf ball and the plot is yellow and purple and the deer just don't want to eat it. Some situations like northern Michigan or northern Wisconsin, some of those big woods areas, they might eat it. But you want to produce something that's going to be highly nutritious, putting on the, the tonnage that it's supposed to put on. So I can't really, you know, I've got my favorites, but then if I'm in the sand, then I'm looking at Ryan buckwheat, you know, fall forage, uh, maybe the soil building or spring, something like that. But if, you know, out on, the, out on our destination food plots that, that's, that's got better soil, by all means, we're doing brassicas and, and the cereal grains. We're doing fall, uh, late season soybeans, stuff like that. But I don't mess with the, the spring planted soybeans up here anyway. To anybody that's got an acre, maybe two acres, if you're in a high deer density, I've tried it many times. I've had cl- customers try it many times. You're wasting your time unless you fence it. And I have a problem right. with fencing because you're... T- I look at it this way, and there's going to be a lot of folks that disagree with me. I don't believe in fencing off a food plot. I believe in planting food that's going to regenerate and keep growing. And the reason I don't like, again, this is my own opinion, the reason I don't like fencing off a food plot, the way I look at it is is if your wife cooked a big juicy T-bone for supper and stuck it on the counter and said, you can't have this for three days. So you're Mm -hmm. kind of doing that to the deer. So again, there's a lot of people out there that, that fence off food plots and it works great for them. I personally don't believe in it. I personally just like to, you know, we tried a three acre food plot here in uh, upper Michigan and we, it just got wiped out. It just, nothing grew. And it was the big brand name forage soybean and they, it was gone. My, my friend grew them and uh, September 15th. Now what do you do? Three yep. acres, yep. It's, it's gone. What do you do now? Yep. You know, yep, exactly. So, and the same thing with corn. Uh, corn is so. If you're in an egg area, absolutely. You know, if there's ten thousand acres of corn and beans around you, oh, by all means, go plant, go plant soybeans. You know, but for you guys with one and two acres that that think, yeah, it looks great on TV. Don't get me wrong. I mean, Mark Drury and Terry Drury, they're blasting 200 inch deer in, in soybeans, <laughs> and and these guys in Illinois. It, but think about where, think about the situation that that they're in versus what we're in. Okay. Yeah. And when I say we're, I'm talking about you and me, Upper Michigan, Northern Wisconsin. Um, you know, most of our, most of my customers, 40 acres or less, one or two acre food plots. So if the situation allows you to grow soybeans, absolutely. But, mm-hmm. but uh, to add, long story short, to answer your question, the best food plot plant is something that's going to reach its full potential. Yeah. Yeah. You know, last week I was on a property, uh, in Southern Michigan and the guy was telling me, so he's, he's had this property for three years and two years right. ago, he, he planted some grains and, and some uh, brassicas and that type of thing. And man, the deer were all over it. They saw so many mm-hmm. deer. And then the following spring, say in uh, March, you know, he found 30 plus sheds on his property and his property is yep. 320 acres. You know, okay. he's got a lot of swamp, got a lot of quality bedding, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he really was able to throw the food at the deer. Well, then the next mm-hmm. year, the next fall, he decided to plant, you know, soybeans. Well, in, in the summer, he, he planted soybeans and boy, they got wiped out pretty quick. And he's mm-hmm. got, uh, I'm going to say probably a total of, you know, five to seven acres of food plots. And he's in a mm-hmm. semi-ag area, you know, so it's not like he's the only guy feeding deer any food. Mm-hmm. And they still wiped out his, his uh, soybeans. And boy, did he pay for it. His deer sightings from his kitchen window, you know, overlooking a food plot uh, where, where he normally sees big ones come out in the last five minutes of daylight. I mean, that activity shut right down. You know, he didn't see the deer sightings on uh, from his stand or on his trail cameras. And get this, he barely found a dozen sheds in the spring. I am never planting soybeans again, you know. And, and he was in an area where you would think that you know, mm-hmm. they wouldn't do that to him. So he's going back to grains and brassicas again. So, yeah. Well, I, like I said, Randy, I think if, if you if you think about, you know, the guys that are A, selling the soybeans, B, promoting the soybeans, 
through hunting shows and stuff, you think about where they're growing and killing deer versus, you know, anybody out there listening, if you're if you're in Iowa and you're surrounded by a by all means, I'm not telling you to not plant them. If you can, great, that's awesome. They're a phenomenal food source, don't get me wrong. Okay. But they're not the only food source you should have. You should have a lot of green like cereal grains, like brassicas. You know, if you've got the room for the beans, if you've got the, the deer density that will allow you to grow them, by all means, go ahead. But, you know, these, these big wood states where there's not a lot of egg, I've seen it firsthand multiple times, just wiped right out. And I don't care if you're planting the QDMA year-old soybean, you get 10 bucks a bag or the $100 brand name soybean. It doesn't matter. I've seen it firsthand. They've eaten them to the ground. So, yep. you know, like I said, what would happen if September 1st rolls around and you're in Wisconsin and bull season is 10 days away or 12 days away and you've got, you know, and you're in your two or three acre soybean field, it's it's gone. Now what do you do? Yeah. You know, you're going to be tempted so, to put bait out. And, you know, well, who, you, but you don't you know, want to go down that road. <laughs> no, that so what well, and it doesn't matter if it's Wisconsin, Michigan, wherever, you know, New York, Pennsylvania, it doesn't matter. So that's why, again, we go back to that multiple strips. You got to plan on something failing, whether they eat the brassicas to the ground or something doesn't grow quite right. You've, there's something else growing. In this spring is a perfect example here in Michigan, and I think it's all over the Midwest. The rains, the floods, the wet fields. I mean, I can see post after post after post, guys angry, upset. They can't go out and plant or they can't go do field work. Well, we took a walk tonight on on one of our food plots that the fall planted cereal rye is now coming back and the red clover and, and the white clover strips. And to be honest with you, if I can't get into the field till June, I really don't care. My, the deer, are, they're doing just fine. They're pounding yeah. cereal rye right now. They're pounding those clovers. Red clover's starting well, to come. They're absolutely smashing that. So the soybeans are still sitting on a shelf all over the country. And yeah. these rye and clover are doing the work, you know, so. And you know, the other, the other nice thing I like about the rye, and, and I saw this on your property last week, where actually it was your neighbors, and, you know, in your garden, you had, you had, uh, in your fenced in garden, you had rye mm-hmm. growing that the deer were not able to get at. And mm-hmm. that rye was drying out the ground a lot faster yes. than, yep. you know, the other parts of the ground where, you know, they had really eaten it down and it was a lot of bare dirt. So, you know, Absolutely. that rye mm-hmm. does so many different things. In addition to, you know, it gets nice and tall in May and June, and, and those like to drop their fawns in the rye. It's a great place for them to hide, you know. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. It, it, it yep. really is a powerhouse. I mean, and I think so, you know, basically it goes back to the question, you know, what's the best plant? Well, I don't think there is a best plant. I think the best solution is to plant a blend. Always have a blend of variety. Like you mm-hmm. said, because you got to plan on something failing because of, you know, whatever conditions that we can't control. Right. And so, and we'll get into this down the road on some other podcasts, but, you know, I really do think that your three strip method that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we both read about from Paul is, you know, one way that you can really feed deer basically 12 months out of the year. Yeah, we've mm-hmm. had, we had a pretty rough winter up here to where I'll, I'll, I'll fully admit the month of I would say 15th of January when we got dumped on with three feet of snow until probably the end of February, there wasn't a lot of attraction in there because one of the neighbors had uh, corn feeders and stuff going. We could see the feeder in the, in, in the, the, across the field, we could watch the deer. So they didn't come into the field, but had that been out, you know, out on, on one of the properties where there wasn't feeding and stuff like that, I would, uh, they would be digging at the clover and the rye, but yeah, yeah. you're right. I, you know that that again. I'll I'll never take credit for that being my idea. This is this is Paul Knox's uh, baby. This three strip planting method. We just uh, I just fell in love with it many many years ago, and I have yet to see from September first till December first something that offers deer twenty four seven. You just there's always something there for those deer. And it doesn't have the covers like corn does, you know, and it and it might not have the ultra cold weather attraction that uh, soybeans do, but um, you know, when it's 40 degrees out and you're out muzzleloader hunting, <clears throat> those brassicas and those clovers are pretty appealing versus those uh, oh, yeah. soybeans. Mm-hmm. Yep, I really think green food, you know, especially, well, if you are in an ag area and your neighbors have corn and soybeans, you know, I, I like to plant something different. I like to have green mm-hmm. food in, in November. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, right. cause boy, when the, when the corn and the soybeans are picked and you've got green food left on your property, uh, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's pretty much a no brainer where they're going to be. But I saw this, this winter, one of our neighbors didn't get their corn off. And when we had that brutal cold spell at Christmas time, a lot of the deer got sucked off into that corn. Now that corn for the last 15 years has been off by end of September. So mm-hmm. that was a fluke. And we went from probably holding 35 deer in that field every night down to about 15. So again, you, they, they have room. Those are farmers are farming, you know, and if, if one of our neighbors decided to plant corn, it might be a tough draw at the end of the year, but I'll put that three strip system up against just about anything. But, but, but again, cold weather, Corn and, corn and beans are pretty tough to beat, but yep. you're talking extreme cold weather. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And when you say soybeans, you're, you're actually talking the bean pods, you know, the bean pods. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously. So, okay. So, you know, I guess what I'd like to do maybe on the end of, uh, of every one of these uh, podcast segments is, is maybe throw off a question, you know, for, for the new guy out there, that's maybe, uh, new to food plots, or maybe he's only done a couple years of uh, food plotting. For somebody new like that, uh, at this time of year, here it is for May. Uh, what what should these guys be doing, you know, right now, um, if they wanted to start a new food plot? So basically, you know, almost got to break that question down into two parts. So let's say a guy's got a brand new spot on his property for a food plot. Let's say it's in a thick grassy area. You know, it, it's it's been like a pasture, and there's a lot of thick grass right there, you know, so what is right. a guy like that supposed to do and start out at, at this point in the year? Uh, probably we would say, okay, where do you think the deer are going to be coming from? Where do you think the deer are going to be heading? Is this, the first thing I'd figure out is what this food plot's going to do. Is this going to be your destination food plot? Is this going to be a kill spot? Okay. How's mm-hmm. the access? How's the wind? Um, because, and it's like we talked about before, if the sanctity of that food plot isn't protected, you know, you, you're, you're just feeding deer at 10 o'clock at night till four in the morning. So yep. that's the very first thing you got to think about. How am I going to get in and out of here? Where's the blind going to be? Or are you going to hunt off the food plot? Where's the stands going to be? Where's your access going to be? So, okay, let's say they've got that all figured out. So now let's get into the manual labor here. So I would mark the food plot out and I would pace it off and figure out how big this is. Uh, an acre is, I believe, 46,000 square feet, 70 yards by 70 yards, something like that. So figure out how big this thing's going to be. So when you start asking questions, whether it's me or, you know, whoever you're getting stuff from, um, you have a pretty good idea of how big this food plot is. Then you go to Tractor Supply or one of the, uh, where you can get some Roundup. You're not, you don't necessarily have to buy Roundup. You can buy a product called glyphosate. You're looking at something like 41% concentrate. And now this is just my experience. If I use a backpack sprayer, I think it's like four or five gallons. We use like a quart, maybe a quart and a half of Roundup. And then we get something that's called crop oil. It's a sticking agent. It basically makes the Roundup stick to the leaf in it so there's better absorption. If you don't have any crop oil, I've used this in a pinch, three drops of Dawn dish soap. Um, I would probably wait till the morning dew is gone. And I wouldn't spray much later than maybe three o'clock because you want the heat of the, you know, the, the sun at the highest point when this stuff is being absorbed into those leaves. You want, you don't want to be spraying wet leaves and you don't want to be spraying at night or towards the evening. That's when you want to spray it. Now, uh, there's a lot of bad stuff in the news going around about glyphosate, whether you believe it or not, I'm not going to get into that, but I firmly believe glyphosate is going to be the next atrazine to where it may become restricted. So don't get carried away with this stuff. Just do what you got to do and make sure you get a good kill. Typically what I'll do, and and I'll wear a respirator and I'll wear the gloves and the rubber boots and, you know, people roll their eyes and say, Oh, you don't need all that. Well, that's my preference. So what I'll do is I'll walk East and West spraying and then I'll walk, I'll walk North and South and then we're done. You get uh, two weeks later, that stuff should be dead in a door. I mean, it should be dead the next day, but it's just not going to, it's not going to show. So two weeks later, you know, three weeks later, you can probably start your field work if you're going to plant now. And the only thing you're really going to want to plant now is whether you're doing something like our soil builder or if you're going to do some clovers with oats as a cover crop or a nurse crop. That's about all you're going to want to be doing now. Or if you're doing some sugar beets. Um, But usually, 
a good spring planting really on a brand new food plot is buckwheat. And I skipped a step actually. Uh, you want to pull a soil test, obviously. That's the first thing you yeah. want to do. I mean, you can start doing your spraying, but you can pull a soil test and it's going to tell you, you know, organic matter. Then there's going to be fertilizer recommendations if you are going to put clover in, if you're going to put cereal grains in, stuff like that. But yeah. I mean, in a real easy spring planting, it's going to hold some deer, uh, but it's going to start, it's going to help suppress the weeds so you don't have to uh, keep spraying and killing all summer long as buckwheat. That's a really good choice. The thing you don't want to do, and I've talked so many people this year and last year out of this, you don't want to start disking and then go back later, two weeks later and start disking again, and then go back and disk again. And next thing you know, it's 95 degrees out in July and you're out there disking and your nice moisture holding food plot is now two, What's the hair three, four, five inches deep of dust. Now what? Yep. Okay. Yep. You lost, you lost um, all your organic matter. You've lost all your organic matter. You've lost all your soil moisture. So I would probably not, if you're not going to plant in the spring, then just spray it. Don't do anything with it. That's what I found works the best because you're just losing moisture. Yeah, you might kill a few weeds, but you're just losing moisture. So we don't recommend doing that anymore. So if you're not going to plant till, you know, if you're doing brassicas, if your soil's up to it and you're going to do brassicas uh, mid to late July, early August, I wouldn't start tilling until the day of planting. Same thing with cereal grains. If you're going to do uh, rye and oats, I wouldn't be doing any kind of ground tillage until the day of planting or the day before or that weekend, you know. So <clears throat> that's, what, uh, that's what they should be doing right about now is figuring out how big it is. And if they're going to do some spring planting, they can start killing it, um, do a soil test, and then, you know, think about where the stands are going to be. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and I, I would just I would just add to that that uh, you know if this is a uh, first time food plot, never been a food plot there before, and maybe you don't need to plant a spring or summer food plot, you know you're just mm -hmm. interested in getting some in there, and maybe in August you know for the fall, then you know j just use the summer to uh, concentrate on you know eliminating all the weed and grass competition. Um, you know mm -hmm. sometimes you can go through and you can spray the whole food plot and everything will die. And if you let it mm -hmm. set about a month, you'll get another wave. Of, You're going to get another wave. Yep. You, have, mm -hmm. you know, these seeds are just sitting underneath the ground for the last, you know, 50 years, just waiting for sunlight to germinate. And mm -hmm. voila, you just eliminated that canopy. And uh, yep. So, you know, that'll give you time in the, later in the summer to kill that second wave off. So that way when you plant in August, you're going to have a really nice weed free seed bed. I guess the other thing I would add too is, you know, sometimes if you're, especially up here in Michigan, you know, we've got areas that got a lot of rack and fern and, you know, which is a good indicator that your pH is really, really low. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you do find on a soil test right away that uh, your pH is low, then you're always going to want to plant or you're always going to want to broadcast your, your lime as soon as possible because it just takes, you know, lime takes a long time to move the needle on that pH, mm -hmm. you know, chart. So um, you'd want, you'd want to get that in early as possible too. You know, there's, there's a couple lines of thought that, that I just don't know about. You know, some people say you can, you can broadcast lime on top of the ground and then just leave it pelletized. Some people say you got to work it in. I, I'm not sure. I've always worked my lime in. So if you actually, so that's what I, if you find out your pH, if you've got a lot of bracken fern, you know, and you've got pH four and a half, five, you know, and you want to start adding lime, what I would do is I would actually do the disking or the tilling or you know, I love my tiller. I got a tiller and it, I'll tell you what, you can't beat a tiller because I can set the height where I want, you know, mm -hmm. do the one pass minimal tillage. Um, but anyway, if you're, if you're finding out you have to add lime this spring, by all means do a buckwheat planting, you know, yeah. even cereal right. rye, you know, keep yeah. the ground covered and buckwheat and rye are two of the, best natural weed suppressors there are so if you've got bracken fern you know you're going to be fighting those for a little uh a year or two you know but yeah. it, you, you got to start somewhere and just just get after it and and, and again if you've got a lime in the spring and go ahead and till that lime in but but get some get some buckwheat planted yep yeah exactly and, and so i guess for the other guy that's on the other end of the spectrum maybe you know he doesn't have many open areas he's in a pretty much a wilderness setting with mostly woods, but maybe he's got mm -hmm. some trails and, uh, you know, he maybe he can take some trees out and plant a little food plot in the woods. So, right. you know, mm -hmm. not going to have full sun. Um, what, what would be your, uh, your go-to answer for a guy like that? Um, 
Yeah. Uh, what I would say again, just like we talked about, if somebody was planting in a field, where's your access going to be? Where's the stands going to be? Where do you think the deer are going to be coming from? Where's the bedding area? Stuff like that. Because again, if you don't have that figured out and figured out correctly at food right. plot, it's not going to matter. The first time you hunt it is going to be probably the last time you're going to want to hunt it. So, <laughs> you know, figure it out. Well, it just, you know, and again, I've made this mistake. Oh yeah, this looks like a great spot. I put a food plot in and, and halfway through your first hunt, you've, you've already sco- uh, spooked four or five deer. So, uh, so get that, that, Sometimes what's around your food plot is more important than what's in the food plot. So anyway, so let's yep, say you got exactly. your stand picked out. You got, okay, I got great access in and I get it. Now, now we're in the woods. Look to the south, okay, especially right now. Because right now is going to resemble uh, kind of like mid-October because their leaves are going to be falling off. What's the canopy look like? Are you going to be able to get sun in this thing? Because if you're not, you're going to really be struggling. Okay, the other thing is, is that I like to see trees knocked back. I see this a lot in these wooded food plots and, and folks don't think about this is two good windstorms after about October 15th, you've got 68 inches of leaves on your food plot. Okay. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot that's going to be growing after that. So um, obviously when you're, you're in the woods, you are going to get leaves on your food plot. And I really don't want to go into my food plots, my little kill plots in the middle of the woods with a leaf blower, October 15th, October 20th, you know, especially those poor, those poor guys that, that, that only have the weekends to hunt. Okay. They don't want to go up Saturday morning and blow their food pot off with a leaf blower and then try to hunt Saturday night. It just, you know, it's probably detrimental to, uh, to deer hunting, having a, a, a blower out in, on their food plot. So, you know, kind yeah. of pay attention to that. What, what do you think, what can you do to keep the canopy knocked back? You know, can you cut some of those trees down for firewood? Can you hinge cut for, for uh, screening, stuff like that, especially to the south, that's where the sun's going to be coming from. That's going to be ultra important because usually in the woods, your soil's not the greatest. So you're going to be behind the eight ball with the lack of sunlight, the acidic soil more than likely, or the poor soil condition. So make sure you can get some sun to that food plot. Make sure your food plot's not going to be buried in leaves. Those are the things you want to look at. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, great. Uh, you know, hopefully that will uh, help some of these guys that, uh, you know, we see on social media uh, looking for some direction, you know, and uh, hopefully at the end of every podcast, we can, we can kind of address, you know, okay, what do we, what, what should guys be doing at this particular time of year? So hopefully we can mm-hmm. get that weekly segment. So, all right, John, well, hey, uh, that, uh, that first hour of our first podcast went by pretty fast and, um, yeah. you know, trying to keep these down to, uh, you know, no more than an hour, I guess with that, you know, we'll wrap it up. But, uh, so just in case guys want to, uh, look you up and, and check out, you know, what you have to offer out there, uh, once you throw out your uh, website out there. All right. Our website is at northwoodswhitetails.com. Uh, we have a Facebook page that's got a lot of this information. Uh, the Facebook page is Northwoods Whitetails Incorporated Food Pod Seed. And we just recently started a YouTube channel, Food Plot Seed for Deer TV. <laughs> I think that's what it is. So Food Plot Seed yeah, for Deer TV? Okay. Yes, I think I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Yep. So, again, we're just, we're just trying to get our message out without wading through all the muck and mire of social, that social media has become. I mean, everybody's got to, you know, they got this and they got that and there's a million and one pro staffers trying to push this and that and the other thing. And we're just trying to get away from all that. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, anybody looking to, uh, you know, maybe, maybe get some habitat work done. You know, you've got a woods, uh, you need some hinge cutting done. Maybe you need some bedding created or some travel corridors made and, and that type of thing. And maybe you, uh, you know, just need some advice on where to put some food plots and how to lay out the property. So, um, I, I offer a lot of that stuff on my website, uh, which is uh, strategichabitat.com. And then, uh, you know, obviously have a Facebook page called, uh, you know, facebook.com slash strategic habitat. I think, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna, there's enough free stuff there available that uh, probably could keep a guy busy watching videos uh, between the two of us all weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully they learn something too. There's, yep. I, we put it out there because, Somebody said I'm an expert at this, and I'm, I, I think I'm far from it. I, everybody has started out somewhere. You know, we were all beginners once. I don't think I'm an expert. I'm just experienced. So and there's a big difference. But, uh, you know, we, 
we we're learning every day and in the spirit of Mr. Knox, I'd like to pass it on uh, what we've learned and, and uh, hopefully uh, the next generation can take that and maybe add something to it. Yeah. And, you know, I think it was uh, Paul that said this, but, uh, you know, when it comes to whitetails and habitat that they live in, the learning mm-hmm. never stops. Oh, absolutely. You'll never, no. you'll never know it all. And, uh, you know, maybe no. by the time you, you think you know it all, it might not be any fun anymore and it's time to hang it up, but. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> all right, John. Well, hey, um, looking forward to doing this again next week. And uh, I don't think we're going to have any shortage of topics to talk about and, and questions to answer. And so, you know, hey, maybe down the road, we'll, we'll throw an email out there that people can submit their yeah. questions and maybe, yeah. maybe we can take a few of those and answer those uh, every week as well. Yeah, I was thinking that. Do you want to do this weekly or do you want to just see how the first one goes and then go from there? Yeah, yeah, we'll just, uh, I guess we'll see how this uh, this first one yeah. goes. And, right. you know, I'm I'm going to be, my, my schedule is pretty much booked out for the next three weeks. You might have a couple so. hours of uh, of uh, tweaking and you might just say, I don't want to do this every week. <laughs> 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 you might say, I'll do this once a month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so who knows but yeah, yeah i'll tell you i you know it'd be nice to talk to i have one i have elliot come on and talk to him because that guy's he's that guy's a genius when it comes to food plots or 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 bones so i, I i'm gonna i just ordered another 10 books from gabe brown so mm. i'm gonna I, I i told him i said i just want you to know now that i said your book is on every ha- uh, hunting page i'm on and i said every time somebody starts talking about something your name pops up and it's kind yeah. of amazing if you think about it. You think about a year ago, nobody knew who there that was guy nobody. was. Nobody. No. Not uh-huh. a soul. And I, I don't want to say that yeah. was all because of me, but I think I had a big part in that because I we started oh, putting yeah. those books out all over everyone's page and talking about Gabe Brown. And all of a sudden, oh, yeah, you got you can't be doing this and you can't be telling. And, and it's kind of comical now to watch people go back and forth about it. <laughs> so, but I, I think some night I'd like to ask them to say, okay, this is what we're doing. And you're going to, I don't want to tell them, you're going to frown upon this, but when I do my tillage, my tilling, what do you think is the minimum I can do? I just need, I just need to get the fertilizer done. Or he's going to say, what the hell are you doing putting fertilizer down? <laughs> you yeah. <know? laughs> yeah. You might, might, you might want to ask Dave Brandt that question instead of Gabe. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dave Brandt doesn't use it either. You know, and, and I'm going to tell, I tell him, look, now this is, this is, keep in mind, we've got the, the, the crack addict for a field that's been sucking on synthetic inputs for the last five years and, and we're slowly oh. weeding it off. Okay. And yeah. there is 50,000 guys doing food plots and maybe 200 of them have a roller crimper or whatever. So what can we do as food plot guys knowing full well, we're not going to go into this no till tomorrow, you know, what, yeah. what can we do? It, it, we're, we've reduced our tillage to one, maybe one time in the spring and absolutely one time in the fall, you know, what, is there mm-hmm. something we can do better? And, you know, kind of stuff like that, that what can, what can you tell us that, that can apply to, uh, you know, everyday Joe deer hunter, food plotter that might be able to make his food plots a little more effective. You know, maybe we can right. grow instead of uh, a half ton of food in this food plot, we can now grow a ton and a half, you know, same size. Mm-hmm. So that's the kind of stuff yeah. I like to ask him. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, Okay. All right, John. Um, hey, great, uh, great first podcast here, and uh, hopefully mm-hmm. we can do uh, we can do these on a regular basis and help a lot of people out. So um, you know, mm-hmm. with that, we'll uh, we'll sign out on this one, and uh, we'll catch up again next time. All right. Thanks everyone for listening, and uh, yeah, we'll talk to you later, Andy. You bet. See ya.